Okay. I think we can all appreciate the benefits of active life, whether you're doing something sort of low activity regularly, like jogging, and this is me in my favorite park in New York, or you enjoy something a bit more filled with adrenaline and this makes you really happy like it does my brother, <laughs> or you have just climbed <laughs> 2,000 meters to give a talk to a group of people and share your idea, and we all did this today. However, as life goes on, some things we can't really control. And accidents can happen, um, and they can happen to people close to us. I know a girl who had a really bad traffic accident, and she had um, open fractures of both of her legs, lost part of her uh, muscle tissue in one of them, a fracture of her arm. So of course she was rushed to a surgery. She needed multiple surgeries with tissue transplantation, with all sorts of metallic implants to sort of straighten her legs, put them back together. Took her more than a year to rehabilitate and walk again and not sit in a wheelchair. A very good friend of mine from New York was 32 years old when she woke up one day and she couldn't feel her left leg. Of course, she went to the doctor, very scared. And after a while, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is basically a neurological condition. You have these specific lesions in your brain that you can see on the screen. They cause all sorts of um, different problems. Um, and this is actually progressing. They don't really have the knowledge what causes the disease, um, what will happen to her, Will these lesions um, happen you know, very soon or she will be healthy for a while longer? So what she's doing, she's taking drugs that the doctors prescribed, some biological treatments and just hoping for the best. And there are actually numerous disorders, diseases as we age. And we know that as a population we are aging, so it's likely that we we'll live long enough to get one of these either neurological, cardiovascular, something with skeletal degeneration um, that we might not be able to treat properly. When you think of it, some of the major problems in medicine today are, do we know a cause of a particular disease disorder? Because then we can try to think how we can treat it. And then if we do, and do we have a treatment for it? If we have a treatment for it, what are the side effects? You know that most of the drugs we take have some side effects. If you have some implants of some materials in your body, they can fail, they need to be changed, and so on. So the question is, can we do better, and how could we do better? And some of us who are working in the field of regenerative medicine think that this might be possible. So one way to do it would be, instead of putting all these foreign things into our bodies, to try to grow replacement tissues and organs from our own cells. And these are some examples from the last 15 to 20 <coughs> years when people were able to grow for the patients new blood vessels, new skin for severely burned patients, and bladder for people who were born without one. These were all examples of tissues that were grown from adult cells, uh, where a small sample was taken from the patient, the cells were grown in the laboratory, and the tissue was made. However, when we develop from a small, tiny embryo into an adult organism, and the cells progressively specialize to do their function in a tissue, these cells also lose the ability to grow. And this is a problem, because for making a very small piece of tissue, let's say one cubic centimeter of bone, you need hundreds of millions of cells. For bone, we need about 80 millions for this cubic centimeter. So it's very hard to get these cells. In 2007, though, a group of scientists in Japan worked on skin cells. So they took a small piece of skin tissue from a patient, grew them in the laboratory, and then they infected these cells with viruses, carrying just four genes. And these genes control very early human development during the time when we are still embryos. And actually, they could turn back time for these cells. They 
turn them back into embryonic-like stem cells. This discovery was reported in a leading biological journal, Cell, and you know a lot of scientists rushed to work in this field. I'm one of them. And actually, it's very hard to grow these cells in the lab. You have to go check them every day, so there are no Saturdays and Sundays. That's why a group of people is working on how can we make robots to do these things. <laughs> but because robots don't care about weekends. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, it's worth it, because these cells have two very important characteristics. So first one is that we can grow them forever. We can get any number of cells we want. The second one is that from them, we can make any cell type find in your, found in your body. We can make nerve cells, bone cells, heart cells, you name it. A lot of these discoveries were reported in various newspapers, media, you might have heard about it on TV. And in 2012, a Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to the two researchers who contributed most to this discovery. One of them, Sir John Gurdon, did his work in the late 50s, 59, 60s. So he had to wait 50 years. Shinya Yamanaka, who worked in Japan, did this discovery in 2007. So he was very fortunate. The Nobel Prize came after just five years. This is really rare nowadays. So you don't want to count on it. You might be dead by the time. You know, Robert told us that for sure. So one of the groups that works on this is the group of New York Stem Cell Foundation. And this is where I work in New York on Upper Manhattan. And the scientists there are from all over the world. As you can see, we map this in a little map. And a couple of us work on trying to make new bone tissue for a generating bone. So I'm the only person in this lab. There are 40 people there from Slovenia. Um, my group, uh, one was from Italy, a postdoc. And then we had two students. One was from USA, one was from Kuwait. So it's very interesting because, you know, cultures mix, science mix, mix dish, different backgrounds mix. Why we chose bone? Because bone is actually the second most commonly transplanted tissue. We need a lot of it in many cases. Uh, what surgeons are doing now is they're taking it from another part of the body. But sometimes the gap we need to fill is rather large. And it's hard to get this much tissue from your hip or somewhere else. So we are trying to make new bone in the lab. But that's rather challenging, because what we usually do when we grow cells in the lab is we put them in these two-dimensional culture flasks where cells are in one layer. And this is very different from what the cells experience in your body. In your body, they are in three dimensions. They have all these signals coming from other cells. So how do we do it? That's why there is a big question mark, right? <coughs> Um, what the biologists need, needed to do is actually to sort of reach out um, and work side by side with engineers. So basically merge the knowledge that we have about cells, tissue development, stem cells with engineering principles. So basically really rationally define the problem that we have at hand and try to design a solution. And this solution would be a bioengineered new piece of tissue. So what we do for bone is actually we first try to image the bone that we try to make. And this is an example of a lower jaw bone. And then we can make a scaffold, which is a template or a model, a three-dimensional model of the new bone that we are trying to grow. This can be from different materials, for example, from decellarized cow bone that we strip off all the cow cells and it can already be shaped in the final shape. Or we can take, uh, let's say, some ceramic granules and put them together into the shape that we want. Ceramic is also very similar to the material, to the mineral that is building our bones. Once we have this scaffold, this template, we see the cells inside, so throughout the whole structure. And you can see these live cells filling the pores. Um, they are green. And this is really important because they need to make the tissue throughout. And then we place this seeded construct in a very specialized culture apparatus called bioreactor. 
that basically pumps the medium through the structure and gives all the cells the appropriate signals, nutrients, oxygen, so they can actually produce new tissue. Then we place them in incubators. This is to control the temperature and pH, just basically to keep the cells alive. And then we maintain this for five to eight weeks. After this time, we take the tissue out and we do a lot of analysis to make sure that it really resembles human bone. So we're trying to see if the structure and organization of the tissue is correct, if it contains the correct cell types, um, proteins, mineral, and so on. So where are we now in 2013? We can make small pieces of bone, about half centimeter size. So this could be used to repair bone around your teeth. If you need some implants placed, this might happen also when you age. And for this reason, we are now testing these small pieces of bone in experimental animals to see how they develop in a body, um, what's happening to the cells. And actually what we've observed is that the bone continues growing, gets stronger, deposits more mineral, and also the blood vessels grow in, which is really important when you consider bone healing. Another option, though, is that we just keep them in the lab, in our culture dishes, and use them as a really good testing system to discover, develop new drugs. Because now these drugs will be tested on human cells, which today they are not. But if we take a small glimpse, or perhaps hope, what will the future hold? I think maybe one possibility is, maybe in 2030, that each of us will have our own stem cells somewhere in a cell bank, and then if you need a new tissue, a new organ, you will go to the doctor and they will design and grow one just for you. So it will be personalized, regardless if this is going to be bone or heart or maybe a kidney.